Welcome to Mindful Minutes with Musicians, the show where we aspire to inspire. Musicians and artists talking about mindfulness and what brings us through our practice to achieve greater goals. Hey everyone, I really appreciate you all for tuning in today uh, to watch this podcast episode of Mindful Minutes with Musicians. And please, if you dig the content, uh, and want to see more, don't miss an episode, subscribe, click on the bell, and leave all your comments below. Today's guest is Ian Kamau, a Canadian hip-hop and spoken word artist whose music and art has toured them around the globe. Uh, along with his music, he's done numerous volunteer work uh, with youth hip-hop projects in here in Toronto, as well as my, my, uh, Montreal, Vancouver, and Nairobi. Um, Ian has just released a short doc for Luminato Festival called We Went Out, and you can catch that on his YouTube channel uh, that I will link in the description below, uh, where he talks about his past and growing up in Toronto. Uh, he's also, uh, along with his father, Roger McTair, who was my college professor, actually, uh, they wrote My Trouble with Books, an amazing set of short stories back in 2018. Um, yeah, you absolutely, you absolutely have to check all of that out. Uh, hip hop artist, filmmaker, director, writer, there's no shortage of talent here. So uh, his music has taken him around the world with songs like Misunderstood, it's totally understandable. Uh, he's collaborated with artists like Chaos and Shad and inspires many people with his art. And he's here today uh, to talk to us uh, and share his take on mindfulness. So huge welcome to Ian Kamau. What's up man, how you doing? Hey, hey, hey. Um, yeah, so I'll start it off with like, uh, how are you? How, how have you been doing? I'm okay. I can't complain. Yeah. Uh, you know, managing the thing that shall not be named as a lot of us are or all of us are. But yeah, yeah, okay. that's kind of the reason for this whole podcast. It's kind of this whole thing that we're all dealing with this new new normal and everything and just kind of like, um you know, show, sharing everyone's point of view on how kind of everyone's kind of dealing with this, you know, and um, I guess, uh, you know, from the beginning of the, the pandemic to now, like, do you think um, that you've kind of been dealing with differently or like, do you think it's, uh, how, how, how's, how have you been dealing with it? Uh, I, I think at the beginning, uh, this may sound weird, but it was kind of a relief to like not be in the, in the everyday, you know, like to actually have some time. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm more on the side of a of an introverted person, and so you know, uh, a lot of energy from people or just day to day life, like it stresses me out. I have to manage it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was for the first couple of months. It was kind of a relief to not have to like be places or be rushing around and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um, you know there was like the anxiety of not knowing uh what the thing was and um mm -hmm. what's happening where is yeah, what's yeah. happening like what how dangerous is it or mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff like there was all of that stuff going on in my head but I was largely at home and I had the privilege to well at the time I wasn't working mm -hmm. Um, but eventually when I started uh, working, uh, I was, I've been working from home and I've been working from home ever since. And so anyway, I'd say for the mm -hmm. first couple of months or even the first year, it felt like a bit of a relief, uh, separate from the anxiety of this, of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But in the last year, uh, I've been telling people, it's like, it's been the most isolated I've ever been in my entire life. Um, mm -hmm. And, wow. you know, so that's been, you know, I live on my own. My father lives down the hall from me. Um, my mother lives not too far from here, about 15 minutes walk from, from my apartment, but her husband has uh, respiratory disease and mm -hmm. all kinds of other health issues like my father. So mm -hmm. I'm comfortable going there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, the the uh, the dealing with um, levels of how far we can go with things and and I like I'm dealing with the same kind of thing 
uh, with my partner's mom who got a pacemaker and heart issues and, you know, and her dad's dealing with, you know, other health issues and, you know, even my parents are aging and, you know, so it's like a whole lot of like dealing with that, but then trying to figure out where this, where, you know, how far you can go as far as like, you know, because you still need to work, you still need to get out, and, you know, and do the thing, you know, so it's, it's tricky, it's tricky. Yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah. definitely, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, it's complicated, but I, I feel like a lot of people that are in and around our age are dealing with similar things in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just the age, like if you do, if you, if you did have the uh, privilege of having a good relationship with your parents that also means that in these age and stages you'll have to you may have to deal with their health stuff or their mental health stuff or you know mm -hmm. documents and the the responsibility of kind of like switching from the care that they gave you hopefully to the care that you give them beyond just staying in touch or something Mm hmm yeah actually being there physically and helping and you know taking those extra extra steps to kind of like do what you have to do to kind of make sure that not only you're safe but they're safe and yeah. you know yeah it's it's uh it's been wild man it's been uh it's been interesting for me i remember it was like you know 200 to zero you know um and uh it was a it was a jarring uh, experience, yeah. uh, trying to figure out where, where the cards land and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm, how do you feel like, uh, it, it, uh, helped you, um, as far as like being at home and being creative and stuff like that, do you find like it, it, um, helped? no, yeah, <laughs> no, not at all. I, you know, at the beginning of all of this, I, I didn't expect it, but I did a Kickstarter for an album project um that ran from february to march 2020 mid february to march to mid march 2020 and it closed the weekend that the first lockdown in toronto happened wow and so i was like maybe this is ideal i'll be home mm -hmm. i have my studio mm -hmm. more to, yeah more time to do the work and whatever there's a couple, there are some things that I wasn't anticipating. I wasn't anticipating how long it had been since the last time that I made music. And so I was learning a lot in the in-between time. I wanted to figure out how to write better songs, how to write better in general, more things around music theory, which I didn't, I mean, you know, I studied music when I was a kid, but it was never, you know, it was like high school. Yeah. And, you know, that's not how we made music, but I got interested in like how I could enhance what I was already doing. And so I just went down the rabbit hole of like understanding music theory more, understanding songwriting more, understand writing in general more, understanding act structure and Frey Tag's pyramid and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it was all, it was a lot of it was in my head, right? And I was also in school at the time. Like I did two back-to-back uh, -back master's degrees, which took me five years. Yeah. So that time, it's just very much like in my head but i was thinking about music all the time and thinking about storytelling all the time and thinking about like how i could uh fix some of the mistakes that i made with the albums that i put out 2010 2011 mm -hmm. both in terms of the music itself and in terms like the business and the marketing and the networking and like the the, the process and the strategy around releasing music i never had a manager or right or any companies around me. So I was always just independent, figuring out how I was going to release stuff. One day soon was the best that I could do with my two hands and whoever like volunteered for me that was around me. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned a lot in that process. Mm -hmm. And then I, I tried a couple of other projects. I tried to do a couple of other projects because people are like, you're doing everything by yourself. You should do some more like collaborations. I tried like three different collaborations. None of them Nothing really came of any one may happen still, mm -hmm. but the other two just were a mess uh, in terms of just uh, anyway, I won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I decided to go back to school after all the tours and whatever for uh, the, the 2011 album one day soon. 
I toured, I was predominantly spent time in South Africa and a bunch of other places on the African continent, 2012, 2013. By 2014, I was back in school. I did a master, I was starting in a master's in environmental studies. And I didn't know that it would end up being two master's degrees back to back in five years. But in that time, I spent a lot of time just thinking, thinking about like my the community work that I did, that I had done, mm -hmm. thinking about writing music, thinking about writing in general. I'm uh, uh, associate artist with the theater center and why not? So I was developing a project with them in throughout that time quietly. Um, and so it just had me thinking about a lot of other things. But by the time I got to the place of just being like, I think I want to do a record. And I applied for a bunch of uh, grants and I didn't get any of them. And that's why I decided to do the Kickstarter. Mm. Um, but by the closing of the Kickstarter, I had been in my head for years around learning and how to do music and other creative things like writing better technically mm. hadn't actually been sitting here you know what i mean yeah making things and so it was such a stretch of time between 2011 when i put out my last project full project and 2020 when the pandemic happened that I'm like, I don't even know how I sound. Yeah. I don't know what, I don't know how to approach even the stories because my life is totally different. Mm -hmm. My father wasn't sick back then. Yeah. Um, obviously there wasn't a global pandemic. Yeah. Um, music had changed. I'd been listening to different kinds of music. And so when I sat down, I was like, this isn't right. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't like how this sounds. I don't like these plugins i don't like them um, everything had changed and i didn't it's like wanna... oh that was that was that was before kind of thing yeah, yeah. And I, I didn't want to just do i was never like the kind of artist that just i get excited by doing new things and exploring mm -hmm. new spaces and so if it was just like i want to do another project like the project that i did in 2011 or or, or 2010 then I could have just been doing that this whole time. But I also mm -hmm. think it would have been boring for me and it probably would have been boring for people to just hear the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. I only really make things when I'm like excited about a new territory. Yeah. And what I describe to people is like, I like operating on the edge of my ability. You know, like I like op operating in the scaffolding, just like we're mm -hmm. trying to build a thing and I'm trying to figure out, that's where I get most excited about all creativity. Yeah. Um, and so I'm always like pushing into the scaffolding, like into the, that kind of empty space, at least for me. Mm -hmm. But also that is a great, there's a great deal of uncertainty there. I, I, so, yeah, I it, just, I wasn't hearing, I wasn't hearing what it is that I wanted to hear and that my mood and like mm -hmm. everything about it was just like very frustrating also because I had the pressure of like 250 people who gave to this Kickstarter, who, who if every time I spoke to anybody in relation to it, they're like, where's the house? Yeah, how's it going? Where's it, you know, where are you at? No, yeah, totally. No, I'm struggling. Yeah. It's, it's been a it's been a struggle. So yeah, yeah. No, it's um it's it's weird because like um the, the there there was that that uncertainty and um unsurety right at the beginning. And I know like for me, I I, I didn't feel creative. I, I felt like that I was just trying to you know keep up with uh, you know life and what was going on and everything like that like for, for um so you know and and there, there was you know for me there was no pressure of of you know something kind of looming like a like a kickstarter or like an album that, that you're you know kind of there's almost ex expectations there of of um you know trying to have that out and stuff like that and so there's extra extra pressures there and yeah um I can imagine it being a lot, but uh, yeah, the, your, your, your kind of analogy of, um, of kind of living, uh, being on the outskirts and stuff like that kind of reminds me of like uh, of, of yoga and like stretching, stretching to a certain point where it's, you know, you, you feel like it's a stretch, but it's, it's just beyond where you're supposed to be stretching kind of thing. Like, so you're not stretching too much, but you're stretching and it, yeah, that type of um boundaries kind of thing but um 
yeah it's it's uh it's it's wild man i i um it's uh it's been a process <laughs> but um but yeah I'd, I'd like to kind of like talk about uh you're talking about collaborations and stuff like that and i'd like kind of lead that into uh your short documentary that you just put out the we went out um how where was the inspiration for creating that and like and sharing your story with everyone on on that kind of level um Um, rosina kazi from lao called me or messaged me somehow and said that she was working with luminato uh as a curator for this thing called Guided by Starlight, which was around uh, music in Toronto. And originally it was about uh, neighborhoods. She asked me about neighborhoods and obviously, you know, I have this uh, long-term close connection with Esplanade where I've lived since I was five years old, Mm -hmm. uh, where I'm sitting right now. (laughs) And um, so I was like, cool, that sounds cool. And then she called me later and said, oh, it's been switched. Like it was something about venues that were close to your neighborhood. So I was thinking about um, government, mm-hmm. whole house, which is like literally right, oh, like right over there. And so, you know, like we would go to shows. It's, it's condos now. It's where uh, Artscape Launchpad is or yeah. whatever it's called. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I was like, okay, that sounds cool. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm interested in doing it. And she called me back later and she said, oh, well, it's kind of been changed to like this idea about the venue closures, that there have been all these venue closures because of the pandemic. In my head, I was like, well, that's also because of gentrification too. Oh, yeah, that happened before. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, I was like, okay, cool. Like venues, neighborhoods, something, something. And when I went away and thought about it in terms of like what I was going to do, it took me a while to kind of get a grounding on what I was going to do. And when I went away and thought about it, it's like a lot of those venues didn't treat us very well. You know, like a lot of them were rock venues. Yeah. They didn't like hip hop. They didn't like black people. They didn't like young people. Well, yeah, there was a certain connotation. There was also like, like, you know, they're thinking about money, right? At, in the end. Yeah. So. And so, you know, I'm like, I have fond memories in, you know, I don't know, the big buff or uh, yes. the comfort zone. I have fond memories in those places. Yeah. But also a lot of them really didn't treat us very good. We did shows there and we were there. We went to other people's stuff and whatever, but mm-hmm. a lot of them really didn't treat us very well. So I thought about what I went and looked up, which is why it's in the film. There's a, there's at the beginning, there's a definition of what a venue is, which is just a, it's a venue is literally just a place where something happens. Yeah. And I was like, so what were really our venues? Our venues were all these in between spaces. You know what mm, I mean? Like, yeah. It was in between the front doors or in the front steps of Oakwood Collegiate. That was meant to be a thoroughfare, just a place for you to walk through. Mm-hmm. But we stood up there for hours and hours and hours every day had like freestyle sessions inside the doors when it was closed that's some of the older footage inside of there it's like just right in the front yeah after uh you know black history celebration where that crew that was a friend of that were friends of ours they uh dynasty people that either went to our high school or didn't go to our high school but came for that celebration for dynasty's first performance in like 1996 or something like that we just stayed mm-hmm. inside the doors with a video camera it was my, my boy rainbow's video camera F- freestyling and we have a bunch of that footage of us kind of in that time between about 15 and 18 or 19 of us slowly going from like that first performance at oakwood collegiate with them my first performance was st- at oakwood collegiate the next year to being mm-hmm. in places like Reverb and the Comfort Zone and the Big Bop and El Macombo and all of these other places. But those, but the majority of our time was spent on the street, in alleyways, on subway trains, on the front mm-hmm. steps of Oakwood Collegiate, at, mm-hmm. you know, at somebody in somebody's living room in some apartment somewhere, 
that's really yeah. where we spent the vast majority of our time making things. We didn't have concert halls or mm-hmm. any, we didn't have a lot of that. We didn't, we didn't go to community centers even. We didn't, yeah. like we were, we, and if you are a person that lives with, let's say your mom in a two bedroom apartment, this is where I live with my mom in a two bedroom yeah. apartment in Esplanade since 1985. Yeah. Um, there was no, there was literally nowhere to be. Like if you wanted to not be up under your mom all the time, you wanted <laughs> yeah. to be with your friends. You're out somewhere. Yeah. You have to go somewhere. You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't go spend time in the, you had a little, have a little like nook in the basement. We didn't have a basement. Yeah. You couldn't go hang out in the backyard. We didn't have a backyard. We, yeah. you, if you wanted to be away from your parents, at the time where you're trying to be, you're old enough to go out into the world and be independent. You had to be on the street, in a park, in a in the front step somewhere, walking in a mall. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's that's basically what it is. It's kind of a combination of that like mid '90s hip hop scene in Toronto, which was felt magical to me because I was '96, oh, yeah. I was 15 years old. Yeah. And I was just moving out into the world and there are people who are a couple of years ahead of me, uh, Cardi, Socrates, Marvel, Rodala, Shaw Claire, like, you know, Tara Chase, yeah. <laughs> Black, like that whole crew, the circle, FOS, figures of speech, uh, paranormal, like yeah. mathematic, uh, the guys from Monolith who are like, two years, one year, two years ahead of us who would start, you know, uh, Beat Factory, Rap Essentials, Esplanade, Concrete Mob, like. <laughs> yeah, man. It was, it was mad, to me, it was magical. It was like, there are people who are in and around my age who look like me, who are from the places where, where I'm from, who are putting music out into the world. I can hear it on the radio. I turn on 88, mm. I turn on 89.5 and I can hear people sometimes that I know people that I see in my neighborhood people that talking about what their lives and it was to me it was magical so it was about that it was about our group of people and how we were like navigating through that space and all of the places that I mean I'm the only person that still lives everybody is shot in front of the places where they lived when I met them Mm -hmm. I'm the only person that still lives in the same place Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of them used to, a lot of them used to come here. You know what I mean? Like my parents were pretty cool. And so a lot of my friends, uh, used to come to my place and we would write here or we would, you know, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just about, it's just about kind of capturing that time and the, and what it, what it feels like to be that age and to have no particular place to be to be finding yourself and to be also be like finding your places and to me that is esplanade it's oakwood collegiate Mm -hmm. subway it's and it's all these in between uh spaces that we spend a bunch of time in underneath the uh, king edward i think viaduct like the under oh yeah that that's that was just thinking that like under under on train tracks under bridges and like because because there was just a wall and there was a bunch of graffiti on that wall so we used to go to see what was new every couple of weeks you know teeth yeah. uh, cm ren hope yeah i like that side of thing so that's what it's yeah like. well it's, I, I, that was like one of the thing the 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 multifaceted world that i loved uh, about hip-hop when i was when i was growing up was was that it wasn't it wasn't just hip-hop there was there was the the dancing and the b-boying and the and the graffiti and like there was there was art you know yeah. what i mean involved in that and there was there was just so many levels to that and um yeah but like these these places and spaces uh it's 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 funny that um it, it to simplify it uh to as like a venue uh, these you know were our venues and I, I remember hanging out there and those were the, the places that we spent our time and stuff like that and yeah, yeah I, that's I, I like that um yeah I like that kind of analogy if you will like that kind of uh or even not an analogy like that's just kind of the yeah, the that's liter- what I was the say. literal definition of it, you know. That's what I was gonna <laughs> say. It's not an analogy, it's just a reminder. Yeah, of what that means. Mm-hmm. It's not a metaphor. Yeah, it's like these literally what that means. Yeah, Event- these were anywhere yeah. where something happens. And so if something happened there, then that's it's a, a venue for that event. Yeah, yeah. 
that's i love that man yeah that's um and there were so many um special times and play and like that 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 happened in these venues that yeah. no that only that group of people saw you know what i mean and that only that and that's kind of that what makes it that much more special you know i think that's that's part of the thing is that only certain histories get told mm -hmm. and like even if it's just like whatever the official histories or the people who were the most successful or the people who were most well known there are some histories that are told that are informal histories that may get told uh by that group of people who don't have like you know i don't know a star on the walk of fame or mm -hmm. a plaque or like you know all these all these um uh, like colonial actors and their statues being pulled down. Um, yeah. There was a, a, there's a place like a history that was, that's being told in these plaques or these historical um, uh, buildings or whatever, like a city tells the stories, but it tells, it tells the stories that it values. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all of those, these amazing stories of young people who are in all these different um, walks of life now. There are a lot of informal stories that aren't, there's not going to be a plaque to where that freestyle session happened in 90s. Yeah. yeah. Inside of the doors of Oakwood Collegiate. Like it's, but could you imagine how much history is in these high schools? If those walls could talk, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, or the amount of history that's like in a bench at mm. you know, George and Esplanade. Yeah. You know, St. Mike's, like I could tell you all, I could write a mm. book yeah. about those benches that sit right underneath where my childhood bedroom is. I could write a book about what happened on those benches <laughs> right there since the 80s. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. No shortage of tales and memories. and Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I have but I I have many parks and uh, benches and and you know uh, corners of schools and stuff like that that are just like so many memories, you know what I mean? And that's where most of the memories were made, you know. And yeah. um, I I kind of have one question to kind of that that is linked to this. Um, can I, uh, who is the we that you mentioned in the documentary? Um, as far as you saying we went out. Uh, and and is that like like even like beyond the documentary? Who who is the we that you talk about? Uh, the we is several we's. The we the we is that's an interesting question, because you'll notice at the beginning of it, I say I never had a backyard, I never had a front yard, I never had a basement. Mm -hmm. But as you soon re, as you repeat friends, that, yeah, exactly. But as soon as my friends come in, I change the I to we because we all had the same situation. You know, we all lived with single parents, our mom, mm -hmm. apartments, one or two bedroom apartments. We all didn't have, whether it was Paul who lived up by um, St. Clair and Christie, and then later moved over to uh, Western Road, whether it was Mia who lived in, sorry, Mia Sky. <laughs> Me and Scott, <laughs> who lived in, um, in Alexandra Park, PO, mm -hmm. north of Queen Street, uh, by by Spadina, or Danilo, who lived on Sullivan Street. Um, we were all in the same that same situation where we mm. lived largely one or two bedroom apartments with our moms, who were single moms, um, and again we didn't have those places to be so i started being like it's about me mm -hmm. me living in this apartment with my mother mm -hmm. but also not because we intended it but at least that group of people they were all in the same situation and so mm -hmm. when we when we went out <laughs> yeah. we went out together because we couldn't there was at the time, there was no one's house that we could go to mm -hmm. be on our own. Yeah. But yeah. also, I imagine that the we was also anybody that had that same experience. You know, obviously, it's told very personally through my like close friend group. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to write it also for other people that have that same experience. And so I'm sure a lot of people could also say just in a casual sentence, yeah, me and my friends, we went out in this way too. Like I didn't, I didn't even know what the title was when I did the first draft of it. Mm-hmm. There was something about when I said we went out in that time where you start seeing the archival footage and there's that quick kind of weirdly magical clip of Toronto and yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Toronto just because it's the CN Tower and anyone who recognizes it, recognize it's not the typical let's, not your, yeah. let's shoot a skyline of Toronto. It's like that person is in the city. Yeah. Just happened to turn the camera and you know what I mean? Like and, I yeah, catch that vantage point kind of thing. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You know what I mean? So so yeah, yeah the, we, the we is the we is my close group of friends and that pr- very particular story about just us and the people that were around us and and what we did in that time. Mm-hmm. But also, I know that there are a lot of people who didn't have backyards or front yards or basements, who lived with single mothers, who who had if they wanted to like be out in the world, they would they would leave their house and they would sit at the benches in front of their building or they would they would walk through the alleyways they would hang out on the street they would go to the Eaton Center they would sit at Dundas Square they would you know they would hang out in someone else's neighborhood I would go over to Mia's place and you know yeah. wait for her in front of her place in Alexandra Park you know my first girlfriend lived at Regent at Oak and Parliament like that that those are all the places that we had in the lobby at Oak yeah. and Parliament talking to you know a girl that I like so yeah I guess that the 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 Sullivan Street was the the rooftop that you guys were that had been mentioned as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's I, the the doc is is amazing, and and everyone who's watching has got to check it out because um, it's yeah, it's it's definitely um, fab. It's really good, um, and it's nice to kind of like see um, that perspective, you know, of you know, because it is something that so many people kind of um can um you know uh vibe with or can can feel you know can experience or like have experience kind of thing so it's um yeah um yeah i i'm gonna like kind of shift uh our direction a little bit and and talk about the the process of writing you mentioned you can even write a book about the those benches um how how is the the the, the writing process uh, when you collaborated uh, with your dad, uh, Roger McTair, um, that um, I mentioned in the intro, how was that kind of process? That was hard. <laughs> that was hard, man. My, my father is, um, my father is a writer. Uh, he's, he's not, he's just not the most focused person on the face of the planet. Like he'll work, but getting him to finish things is difficult he's a you know, he's a he's a, a perfectionist um but those stories were at different stages of being completed i think there's maybe only one of them that was that was new mm-hmm. uh, and more of it was just like getting him focused enough to be able to complete those stories and put it into some kind of a package but at the end in and around when the editing processes were process was happening for his stories I just felt like it was necessary to, to in to frame and encapsulate it, mm-hmm. and so you know I didn't do any work with his stories really outside of some choices and um, uh, mm-hmm. making sure that he had a proper editor and you know I des- I designed the book I did all the typography and all that kind of business. Mm-hmm. In terms of the stories, I didn't really have I don't think I had much impact on it, mm-hmm. but. I wrote the forward and I wrote the forward because I thought it was important to actually frame where these stories were coming from mm-hmm. and not just have them be a bunch of stories, you know? So I wanted people to read the forward and have an understanding of like where this book was coming from, mm-hmm. who my father is, his relationship to Trinidad, his relationship to Canada, his relationship to you know Marival and Port of Spain and you know, St. James and uh, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, and then his relationship to Toronto um, and the Caribbean community in Toronto. And 
and the, and the things that were happening in Trinidad and the things that were happening in Canada, to, to, to have so many of this group of Caribbean people come to, uh, come to Toronto and form a community inside of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, his, um, in 1970 was the Black Power uh, Revolution in Trinidad. And a lot of people, including a lot of my father's friends, were getting arrested. Mm -hmm. um, around the same time is when Trudeau moved the country from biculturalism to multiculturalism. Part of that was for labor, not necessarily like for ethics, but for labor in a class structure. And so I think it was 70 or 71 when that happened. And so it opened the door for people to easier get from places in various Commonwealth countries to like get into Canada. Mm -hmm. so my mother had gone to New York and my father had tried to go to New York. He wouldn't let him in New York. So he came to Canada, he came to Toronto um, to kind of figure out because there he had a bunch of friends that were here as well. And so it kind of, it's, you know, the story comes out of that reality like there's a larger political and social reality there's a historical reality of the relationship between canada the caribbean and britain specifically trinidad canada and you know the uk mm -hmm. and that history is a colonial history but also there's all these stories that are inside of it and my father's is one of those stories that moves from that island to this city and all everything that ha that happened in the in the interim and those stories come out of that life you know what i mean mm -hmm. he writes fiction but you can hear that it is him in a lot of the stories it's pretty clear that it's like him in a lot of the stories mm -hmm. so i wanted to just not say outright this is him but yeah. but to frame it so you have an understanding that when you read those stories that are meant to be fictional that you can hear because you've read the forward, you can hear, oh, this, you can There's... see the connection between the, this is not a person that is similar to the film. This mm -hmm. is not a person that is outside of this story. This is not yeah. a documentarian who went and wanted to speak to, you know, Paul Sakachan and Danilo McCallum and Mia Sky and was like, tell me about how it was in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. This is a person that grew and lived that whole thing with that person. Mm -hmm. uh, with those people and they are that's part of the reason why i i shot me walking into the frame a lot and the thing with mia where i'm like can you come a little closer you can see my hand a bit at the side and i'm right like, yeah yeah like i'm trying to also give you an understanding it's me like you're you're in I'm there in yeah. that friend group i am not some external force and it's the same thing with the book to give you an understanding though he's inside of all of these stories it's not he's not writing some fiction about something that he researched he's mm. writing something about his life and his friends and his experiences even though it's fictionalized yeah do you find you got a lot of um uh, inspiration from your parents as far as that kind of like um yeah. writing and that kind of stuff I mean, I've been watching my father write for his entire life. I've been reading his stories and his poems and his plays for my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I used to go uh, when I was at York University, he was teaching at Seneca. Mm -hmm. and so that's, I, uh, that's where I met him, actually. And I, that's, I, know. Uh, that's, I know. Uh, yeah. And so I used to go and sit in on his classes sometimes, or I'd go visit him in his office and like, you know, just kind of be around. Yeah. We always had a close relationship. So I was always around him, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? My parents separated when I was seven, but my father never went anywhere. Like I say, yeah. I'm a single mom because I lived here on my own with my mom, but my father was always with me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the, the uh, inspiration was there kind of thing. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. My, you know, my father is a lover of jazz and blues. And, um, and so I, I grew up in a house that where it was like, always like, you know, I don't know, McCoy Tyner and John Coltrane and obviously Miles Davis and mm -hmm. Freddie Hubbard and et cetera, et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. uh, playing all the time. Sarah Vaughn, Nina Simone, you know, like just playing all the time. Classics. And yeah. While my, while my father would be writing. So mm -hmm. my sensibility is 
literary, I guess, and also I feel like it's very influenced by jazz. It, it may not sound like jazz, but mm -hmm. you know, like I was, I was uh, Charles Officer called me about the about the film, and a couple a couple of filmmakers have spoken about the pacing of the film. Okay, and I'm like, I, I make music. Yeah, <laughs> like the editing, <laughs> the rhythm of it is to me, it's like yeah. it's like yes, yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's not necessarily just on beat, but it has a syncopation mm -hmm. to it. It just feels like I don't know where I'm gonna place this cut or the eye. Like if you watch the eye movements, like all of the, all a bunch of the stuff that's there is on a kind of a. <laughs> you know what I it's mean? Like, like on, on like a yeah on a it's beat. Not on a, it has it has a meter it's it's or maybe it doesn't have a meter it, but it definitely has a rhythm even though it may not actually be on a beat but it has a rhythm it it mm -hmm. goes slower it goes faster there are some places where it's like there's, there's parts know, yeah it's, it's going to be placed somewhere even though there is no beat on that thing it just feels like in that empty space that's the place to make it happen it's yeah. ryth very rhythmic I, I noticed a couple parts uh, in, in in we went out where you have almost three um, quick images, yeah, and then it'll go to something else, uh, <laughs> yeah. and it's almost like a one, two, three, four. You know what I mean? You're counting in to the next kind oh, of exactly. uh, those spaces. Point. Those spaces were just black before; oh. they were just open spaces that were just black. And I thought I it would be interesting to put photos that related to the story that was coming. I, or yeah, the, I, either coming or was about to come oh sorry was either about to come or had just happened and so you'll see also growing up happened there in those things the first tick, one is tick, like yeah. me as a kid there all, all of those are shot within a block of my building huh. right? and it's but 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 and but yeah. what that is that if you listen to it what that is is someone knocking on the door mm. and then the next one is a turning of the door and an opening of the door. And the next one is a closing of the door and the putting the key and turn and locking like lock the door. in the door. Yeah. The next one is stepping down like the the side exit uh -huh. of my building. And then the next one is two steps and then the door opening. Like the process of all those photos mm -hmm. are the are in this in the audio sphere or the sound of someone coming to your house like is come out home and it, then oh, it, going out together yeah that's what that is so it's subtle uh -huh. but that that's where the thing is and you'll notice it starts with me as a kid then it's us at oakwood then mm -hmm. it's hip-hop thing then it's i can't remember what the fourth one is and the last one is up us now going back to oakwood literally last summer just on the mm. front steps it's not photos it's actually um it's uh it's moving images yeah it's part of the same thing like, this is us growing up i love that man that's awesome <laughs> growing up yeah no it's 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 funny that you mentioned that but yeah like there's those little like that that knock and those the the sound like yeah uh, it, it's now that you mention it it's, it's you you hear not really meant like it's yeah. a lot of atmosphere right it's not really meant for you to notice mm -hmm. yeah just to be in the ether as another layer to kind of bring you into the larger story. Like the first version didn't have any sound design. Like it had my voice, it had mm -hmm. the music and it had whatever sound had was coming out of the camera. Mm -hmm. But when you see that shot of the lake, there were no seagulls. Like I went back and I put in seagulls because I wanted, if you were listening in headphones, I wanted you to hear slight seagulls like from different directions, pan yeah. left, pan right, straight up the center. I wanted you to hear that. Like the, those yeah. little things about the, the, what do you call it? The wind turbine turning. I wanted to hear it go yeah. like this and then have those weird kind of chords that came out of it. I wanted to, mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, you heard the subway, but I also wanted you to hear those, the pillars go by. And so again, if you listen to it in headphones, you'll hear them go from left to right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, 
wanted to hear all of that stuff. I wanted to hear kids playing and dogs barking. None of that was in it before. And so I, I spent a bunch of time just building those sounds and placing them inside of it in the places where I felt it was appropriate. So yeah. the back, the shot of the back of my building, it's literally right here, the shot of mm -hmm. the back of my building, you'll hear, if you listen in headphones, you'll hear children playing on your left and you'll hear dogs barking on your right. I don't imagine that anyone will really notice why, but also, if you are sitting looking in that direction, the playground in Esplanade at St. Mike's is to your left and the, and the baseball diamond where people walk their dogs is to the right. Now, I don't know who's gonna be so specific Pick up. Yeah. that they know that that's the case, but if I could just make a subtle choice, like where's the playground and where's the dog park, then why not pan it left and right? Because that's that's where you would be hearing those sounds if you were standing in that location. You know what I mean? Totally, totally. So, that's yeah. That's a bit of a um, kind of a placement, uh, audio placement, uh, like placing you in that spot to to kind of experience. That's what I mean. That. It's not. It's not to have people like know that, mm -hmm. but it's just to create more environment to go into that world. Mm hmm. It's uh, it's uh, that level of mindfulness of detail. And, yeah. And uh, yeah, I I'm going to kind of like swivel a little bit in in back in 2006. Um, there's a clip uh, on YouTube uh, of you doing the Montreal Youth Center, uh, uh, Montreal Youth Center. Oh, um, okay. yeah. With uh, <laughs> doing a freestyle with chaos. Heaven only knows that arguably uh, should have been put on the record. Um, uh, can I ask? I, I think so. Um, um, can I ask where, like, as far as inspiration um, and like freestyling and stuff like that, um, on, on the, the kind of mindfulness side of things, where where does the kind of um, the inspiration and, and 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 creativity kind of come or flow from that? Like, I, um, yeah, I guess that's like, and like, how is like how is that process? And yeah, cool. freestyling, yeah. Uh, it's improv. It's improv. It's, mm -hmm. uh, that's a, you know, again, that's to me, it's jazz or it's like in Trinidad, they would call it X tempo. The Calypsoians call it X tempo. Like, mm -hmm. just like saying rhyming things over music, sometimes in a competition. Mm -hmm. uh, X tempo is like a battle uh, where you're just like, Sometimes you're just insulting somebody or sometimes you're like making jokes or it's very, I don't know. It's, I think that's very much in like the black African culture around the world. Um, and so it shows up in jazz and blues. It shows up in cutting contests and battles and it shows up mm. in tempo. It shows up in sound clashes. It shows up in, you know, all kinds of forms because it's kind of like it's it's kind of like uh sport or um yeah it's improv it's uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's improv so you know i think it's i think you very much have to be in the moment um mm -hmm. i think it's it's been hard it's harder when you get older because it's like it seems like silly sometimes or Mm -hmm. Ever, but we didn't obviously we didn't think about it like that it's just you're in the moment and you're letting whatever happens happen mm -hmm. the more that you do it is the better you get at it like you know i guess I mean? like like anything when you practice and that kind of stuff yeah. the more you do it is the better you get at it and again i i never I thought of my relationship with hip hop as something that was communal and that was sport. I never really thought that I would be like a person that made music. It was just fun for me. I, the first years of me like doing hip hop mm -hmm. was all what you see. And it was just us freestyling, like in a space. I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to make a song. I'm going to be a rapper. I'm going yeah, to write it right now. Yeah. It was just like, this is what we do in the same way that these guys play basketball or 
you know, I had a friend that was into um, martial arts. Like this is just one of the hobbies. This is our hobby. This is a, this is our sport. This is the thing that we do when we have time and space. Some people go to park and they'll shoot a basketball and some people will go sit on those same benches and they'll just like freestyle with each other. They'll go back and forth. They'll like, you know, we used to battle each other all the time, like just insult each other in the most horrible. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. yeah, it's, you know, to me, it's part of that. I mean, if I think about it intellectually and historically, mm -hmm. we were a bunch of kids that used to freestyle. But if I think about it intellectually and historically, yeah, that comes from Africa, African traditions of like, that have um, kind of disseminated themselves through all these various cultures that originate largely from West African cultures. Mm -hmm. um, heavily, heavily insp inspired by, you know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, not just heavily inspired by, like, in the lineage of, like, mm. to me, hip hop is a Caribbean art form. Yeah. The people who started hip hop, they're Jamaicans and Trinis and Bayesians and look all those people up. Yeah, I mean, and you'll find where they were from, and and a lot of them immigrated from those places, or their parents were from those places. Like, all mm -hmm. so many of these people are Caribbean people, and if you look at what was happening in the Caribbean and Jamaica and Trinidad and Guyana and whatever, in terms of the DJ culture there and all that kind of stuff, you will see what looks like hip hop before we have an understanding of hip hop in the fifties mm -hmm. and sixties and forties. Yeah. You'll see the the seeds of what would eventually be what we call hip hop mm -hmm. that started in the South Bronx. Because who was in the South Bronx and why were they in the South Bronx is the question I often don't, you know, I don't see people asking. Yeah. Why were certain individuals in the South Bronx as New York was falling apart in the 60s and 70s? Right. What I mean, when yeah. white flight was occurring and certain people could not leave those spaces when the music programs were being cut and all that kind of stuff. Who was mm -hmm. there? And why were they there? Where is, where is Grandmaster Flash from? Yeah. Where is Cool Herc from? Where yeah. is uh, Crazy Legs from? Right. These yeah. are all Caribbean people. Yeah. Where's Puerto Rico? You know, so. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's, uh, that's a point that's uh that's, and that's like basically you know it's just lineage right it's like where where things are coming from yeah. and so then the, the second question is okay so where were those people from but the next question is people in trinidad people in jamaica people in haiti people in barbados people in where were they from how did they get to trinidad yeah how did they get to jamaica where were they from mm -hmm. And now we're talking about the middle passage. Yeah. We're talking about largely people from West Africa who came there via triangle trade and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, indentured servitude and slavery. That's yeah. how, how they got there. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's the yeah. lineage. It's not like inspired. It's not even inspired from it. No, it is it's the that. lineage yeah. of, the, of that particular thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think I can say um, many 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 have taken that inspiration um, and and you know like used it in, in many other musical forms and and many other like um, artistic practices and stuff like that. But to say like where it began, you know, then yeah, that's yeah. you know you gotta exactly. like you have to kind of pay respect to that. Exactly, that's ours <laughs> fundamentally. That is ours. I don't mean yeah. in an abstract sense. I mean like yeah. that form is ours. Whether yeah. it is in North America, Toronto, New York, or whether it is where it emanated from, mm -hmm. Trinidad, Jamaica, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? Puerto Rico, Haiti. Yeah. And where those people came from. Yeah. The I mean, world. That, that is the lineage of that thing. That is ours. That's our culture. Yeah, yeah. The world, the world's uh, an open place, and there's uh, there's been movement, and that movement has has uh, brought uh, a lot of. I mean, you know, amazing it's open, things. You know, an open place, and it's a closed place. It's a violent place. Like the those those movements didn't yeah. happen for fun, right? Those, those no, it wasn't. It wasn't. A, all right, let's let's try this now. It was there was. Hey, let's yeah. go to Trinidad. We're like sitting in somewhere in the in the in the northern part of Ghana and. Tamale or yeah. something 
in Ghana. Hey, you know what? We should go. We, we should, should go. go. That's yeah. Not- <laughs> no, not that's not not what So, but um, yeah, I I I'm gonna kind of like uh uh pivot things a little bit um, but I just want to ask um as far as like mindfulness and and your practice um over over these years um you're talking about like you know freestyling in the hallways of of Oakwood Collegiate to to doing two masters recently um how how do you feel like your practice has changed over over that time or over the years um as far as yeah I think it's all I think it's all part of the same thing like it's I think it's all part of the same thing um you know, I'm, also, I'm, a, I'm as proud of my master's degrees am I, as I am of that freestyle in the, in Oakwood Collegiate, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, I think I've, I've expanded, like I think you grow in a life and hopefully you continue to learn. I have a, I have a great desire to learn. I, I don't care how, you can learn from, I learn from my godson and my, um, and my niece on a regular basis who are you know mm. 13 and 14 like you'll learn a lot talking to children um For sure and yeah you know i learned a lot from you know my professors at york i learned a lot from you know my my ex-girlfriend who lived at parliament and oak in regent park when we were you know 17 18 years old i learned of you know you learn you learn from people and you learn from experiences wherever you find them. I don't have any, mm-hmm. I don't have any great sense of value when it comes to a master's degree, as opposed to uh, like a dude that I met on the street. You know what I mean? Like it's all learning to me mm-hmm. and I, I don't privilege out different kinds of learning. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you should be learning in every space where you have the opportunity to learn uh, and and hopefully bring those things into the things that you create, so you can show people things, or you can uh, you can be in conversation uh, with people on whatever level, and bring something of val- of value yourself into the world. Like br- pull things together, or like because to me that's what the creativity is. Like mm-hmm. it's really the ability to see. I like art. The artists that I like the most are artists that have wide references. That's why, regardless of the kind of the the, I don't know what you call it, the complexity of our friend Kanye West. I still love Kanye <laughs> West because yeah. like his references are so wide. Like he 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 believes mm-hmm. that not just he believes that he can like do anything, yeah, <laughs> but also he actually moves into a bunch of places. To me, that's the thing that gets lost in all of the fame and the kind of celebrity blah 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 is that this is a person that is has a wide references mm-hmm. he does a lot of things because he has so many different references in his head he's interested he's curious he cares about things and all of the artists that i love there are people that are like that mm-hmm. kanye is like john coltrane or nina simone or these people who are just like curious bjork or you know i don't know Mm -hmm. um york like who are just interested like who get bored easily (laughs) and they're just i don't want to do this again let's do it all with computers now yeah you know what i mean like yeah those are the people that i find they're they're restless yeah pushing pushing boundaries they're restless that's what i mean by scaffolding yeah Yeah, i'm here but what could we build Mm -hmm. let's expand it let's let's go somewhere else let's you know people who are well traveled who go places who understand that their little sliver of the world is not the mindset of every place on the planet who aren't being like, ah, speak English yeah, or some craziness like that. Like who are like, there are people in the world, <laughs> like they, they express themselves in all kinds of different ways. They are similar in all these ways and they were different yeah. in ways and those differences are fascinating and the similarities are just as fascinating. And, how do you express and how, what do you read and what do you listen to and where do you go and who do you know and all that kind of stuff. Like that's the mm-hmm. thing that is, that's interesting to me. And there's, um, the world is a small and a, and a large place at the same time. And there's just a lot, there's a lot to learn. You can learn 
you can learn things you can learn things from talking to an old lady who lives down the hall yeah you can learn things from traveling to the other side of the world and speaking to some you know a writer from who's receiving an award from blah 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 you know what i mean yeah. but at the end of the day all that it's just people yeah it's just people and places and 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 history and stuff <laughs> just mm. you know. yeah no it's true it's true it's, it's like it's 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 influences and 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 um and behaviors and um, yeah. you know you just kind of like uh yeah um i i i also want to ask about um like kind of talking about mindfulness and stuff like that and like uh what kind of things uh do you use or is there any things that you use to kind of get yourself into a mindful state or uh you know anything that kind of use to get yourself you know before you are creative or you want to be creative or that kind of stuff like is there anything that you do really particularly I don't have any intentional rituals. I walk a lot, but I don't do that intentionally. I do that because I like to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's good to be outside. Uh, and I've done that for my whole life. And so I walk. If I walk, like if I'm just going for a walk, I'll walk anywhere between an hour and three hours a night. Um, that helps me, but it, that, it helps me clear my mind, but also, I don't do it intentionally. I didn't say I'm, I didn't say like, I'm going to walk because it's a mindfulness practice. It's just, that's what I like to do. Um, mm -hmm. So I, there's, I don't know that there's intention in that. It's just, I've always done that. Mm -hmm. um, my parents never had a car. So I'm, I'm not a, I'm a downtown guy. I never, yeah. <laughs> I, I never, I was never driven places or anything like that. Like I took the subway, I walked, like that's how it was yeah um and still it is i i still i don't even have a license you know what i yeah. mean <laughs> yeah um i did you know a, a good friend of mine alex young uh we went to daycare together that's how long i've known him he got into um oh, i'm not just got into this is years ago he's a teacher now um uh vipassana uh okay. mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. And he asked, this is years ago now, he asked me to come to like a, a night, one night thing. And then I did a retreat with him um, at one point. Nice. Um, yeah. um, just like, you know, quiet meditation for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And I still reference that a lot. I don't, I don't keep it up. If I do, if I do meditate, that is the form that I use because that it, it was just so much more practical, I felt, than a lot of the other forms that I had attempted. Mm -hmm. I'm a very practical person. You know what I mean? Like, if yeah. this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. It's like, I'm very systems oriented. That's how, where I work now. Right, right. Like design thinking and systems thinking and innovation in the Department of Canadian Heritage. So nice. my mind works like that. And so that was the form that, 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 that kind of um, that clicked with me most. Mm -hmm. but I don't keep it up as a practice. There are there are spans of time where I would every morning I would do ten minutes, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, but I never really stayed with it. You know, I also really liked um, before the pandemic. I was running regularly. Oh, nice! Yeah, like I would go to the gym and I would uh, and I would just be on the treadmill for half an hour, or forty minutes, and just I really liked the difficulty of it i mean you can tell i like a lot of solitary things you yeah. know um i just like the the difficulty of it of, of of getting to a point where you would get you would you would hit a breakthrough you would have to push and push and push and hit a wall and hit a wall and hit a wall and if you just kept doing that eventually your body would be like okay go mm -hmm. run for another 10 minutes all of a sudden where yeah. you well, that was always your break for two weeks, three weeks, sometimes you're like, ah, hit a wall, hit a wall. And then one day you just look at your, you know, your, your phone or something like that. And you'd be like, man, I just ran for 15 minutes beyond where my previous barrier. Yeah. Got yeah. this light, open feeling in your head. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I love that. I love that too. To me, it was just, you know, obviously running to me is an extension of walking. Yeah. You know, um, 
but with the difficulty of it. I think like as far as you're saying, like going for a walk and 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 not it actively being a meditation, I feel like that kind of stuff, uh, because there is active meditation, like there it's I, I feel like that's kind of, you know, you subconsciously doing that um to get yourself in a meditative state, but without kind of the cause and effect or that, you know, without the um actively doing that kind of yeah. I think, you know. I think that awareness is very important and we live lives that are cluttered in our world and mm -hmm. in our homes and in our heads. And I think it's whatever way, I think knowledge is one of the ways to become more aware. Um, but I also think there are other forms of knowledge is like a very practical kind of form of, of, of a kind of like awareness. Like I didn't know something and now I know it. Mm -hmm. You read a book and you're like, Oh, I read, you know, on ways of seeing or something like that. And now I can see paintings better because I have this knowledge or, mm -hmm. you know, I watch a YouTube video or something like that. And it's about cinematography. And so now I understand, you know, um, uh, three-point lighting or something like that yeah um but then there's another kind of meditation there's sorry not meditation there's another kind of that's a freudian slip there's another kind <laughs> of there's another kind of um awareness that has to do with like the awareness of self or the awareness of space or the awareness mm -hmm. of your own thoughts you know what i mean like yeah. what am i feeling right now and, and i think us uh, uh, there are a lot of people that actually don't do that mm -hmm that aren't aware of them. Like, why am I doing this? If I respond yeah. in this way, why am I doing this? Where does yeah. that come from? Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, my mom used to do so-and-so. And so I got uh, this fear because my mom had this fear. And now I see this thing as fearful, uh, dangerous yeah. because yeah. of my mind, not because of perceiving danger. Mm -hmm. yeah. like I wouldn't walk through those neighborhoods at night like those places are dangerous and I'm like are they are they dangerous because you saw dangerous or the, because you saw danger or are they dangerous because you, you heard that this place is dangerous like there's an idea of danger and then there's actually danger is it dangerous walking through Esplanade or Regent Park at two o'clock in the morning or are you there aware when danger occurs and spotting danger or are you saying this whole place is dangerous mm -hmm. but then we got to go into what stereotypes are and are you scared of black people are you scared of poor people are you it's scared just, of yeah you know what i'm saying like yeah it, then it becomes beyond kind of just the awareness at that point and it becomes exactly. like you know what have you may have you constructed that or is that what is actually present mm -hmm. no yeah i think that I think all these, I think some of it is just asking the question, like, what is that? Yeah. Where did, what is that? Where did it come from? Yeah. I why, think, why do I think that? Yeah. I think like myself personally, I had to get to a point where I uh, had to do, had to do that. Like had to be like, all right, now I have to kind of self-assess and, and, and think, all right, what, why, why did that happen? Or, or, you know, exactly. how is that happening or that kind of stuff? Um, and I don't feel like that uh, naturally, uh, came yeah. and naturally happened it was something that you actively have to like you know think about what you are experiencing you know and, is that and, exactly and why it, and yeah is that what i'm experiencing or mm -hmm. is that how i'm coloring this experience mm -hmm. and i think making the separation between those two things is something that all that i guess mindfulness mm -hmm. but like just to me, it's like a self-analysis. Mm -hmm. There's a woman named Karen Horney, who's a, a psychologist or psychoanalyst mm -hmm. um, who wrote a book called Self-Analysis that was just about, like, do we have the capacity to analyze ourselves in the way that a psychoanalyst would analyze a patient? Do we have the capacity to do that? And what are the process? And a lot of that book she doesn't like mention mindfulness, mindfulness, but a lot of that book sounds like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have the ability to see yourself 
as you are, to see your actions as they yeah. are. It or almost, it yeah. Col- or is it just colored by all the stuff all the time and we're inside the color as opposed yeah. to inside what's actually happening? Yeah, it's almost like, are you mindful of it or are you kind of um, exactly. passive or whatever? Um, and this kind of leads into my uh, my final question. Um, and it's, a, it's kind of a, the, one of the bigger ones that I ask everyone is, uh, what is mindfulness to you? Um, it's, I guess it, to me, it's just like the practice, the consistent practice of awareness. Mm-hmm. Think. Yeah. Like the ability to understand for instance, like all the information that's coming in through your various senses and your thoughts to be able to, mm-hmm. first of all, see them, like to not be inside of them, mm-hmm. but to be, to experience them and to be like, oh, I'm angry, as opposed to just being angry, to be like, oh, I'm angry. I'm feeling this. Yeah. Anger. Okay. Ang- why am I angry? Anger is a secondary emotion. Why do I feel vulnerable? Where did that come? Is am I vulnerable, or am I feeling vulnerable? Mm-hmm. It, what ratio of those two things is it? If I'm feeling vulnerable more than I actually am vulnerable, where did that come from? Oh, what's the history of that? Like it's tracing. It's like uh, it's like I was told a lot of people that the the film is a mapping exercise. And so mm-hmm. it's the same thing. It's like mapping, mapping your mind or mapping your emotion or mapping mm-hmm. your thoughts or mapping your, that's what it is. It's finding what's actually happening mm-hmm. in whatever way you can do it. So your, your feelings are all emanating from like a, a need, a, a, a met or an unmet need, right? So you're like oh man i'm hungry so now i'm frustrated okay so yeah. how do you, how do you meet that need or i'm i'm upset because i'm disappointed because i feel insecure you know why do i feel insecure well i'm asking for love and i'm not getting it like you know mm. what i mean like, trace all of these things like a map or you can just be pummeling through the world that's stumbling through the world you know right. what I mean? No yeah. idea what's going on and just like slamming into walls and then getting upset at the wall because it was there. You know what I mean? So I think yeah. mine is that. It's the, it's the process of opening up your awareness and understanding the, what is around you, but also who you are and where all of those various things emerge from. And the more that you can do that, is the more you can see yourself, but also the more you can see other people. So when someone gets upset at you and you don't, you're not really sure why, you can be like, anger is a secondary emotion. They're feeling this kind of vulnerable, maybe because of me, maybe because of some other thing. How do I speak to reassure the vulnerability as opposed to, and act, sorry, not just reassure, Mm -hmm but act in integrity to not do whatever it is that's sparking that thing, as opposed to speaking to the anger, because I'll probably speak to your anger with my anger. And Mm -hmm. then we're not actually talking about anything. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, about two distant secondary things that don't have to do with the thing that we're actually concerned about. Anger mm -hmm. is the defense mechanism, you know? But um, the awareness, the awareness of self kind of thing, and that Mm -hmm. awareness of, of, um, you know. Yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah. I uh, thank you. That's a, I, I think this is a great spot to kind of conclude. And uh, I really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this outro track, but uh, I, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing uh, all your thoughts and yeah, this has thank been, I appreciate it. This has been an amazing process. Thank you for tuning in to mindful minutes with musicians. For more information about my guest and the topics of the show, go to blackmoremedia.ca and connect with us on all social media platforms. Welcome to the MMWM family, where we aspire to inspire. See you soon.
Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in and um, being here to listen to uh, our amazing guests. And uh, yeah, I, Ian, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for spending your time here. And um, yeah, I really appreciate yeah, this. Yeah. Appreciate it.